Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by Loserpool.com. I'm your host, Harry Simeu, and on this edition, I'll be looking back at the draw down at Brighton on Boxing Day. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas spent with your loved ones. I hope you all had plenty of food, plenty of drink and plenty of rest because the football is coming thick and fast now over these next couple of weeks. Uh, so let's get right to it. So let's start off with Unai Emery's initial team selection, as always. Uh, Burned Leno in goal, a back four of Sead Kalasinac, Laurent Koscielny, Socrates and Stefan Licksteiner. Um, a midfield trio of Lucas Torreira, Granit Xhaka and Matteo Guendouzi, with Mesa Ozil supporting Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Alexander Lacazette. Now, looking at that team initially, I'll be honest, I didn't have an issue with it. Um, I was pretty pleased overall, I think. A back four was the sensible thing to do, given the personnel available to us. Um, so I was glad to see that. Mesut Ozil was, was in the starting lineup again. I was pleased to see that in an away game. Um, I thought we, we've missed his creativity at times. Um, I know some people have been highly critical of him of late and, and probably don't feel that his contribution against Burnley was as big as I did, but I, I was pleased to see him back in the side. I must admit, initially, um, I thought he was going to sort of occupy the position in between Lacazette and Aubameyang um, just in that area uh, behind them and, and sort of the fact that Torreira, Guendouzi and Xhaka were playing would give us that extra bit of protection, meaning he'd have a little bit more freedom. Um, that's how I hoped it would be. I didn't think it was actually like that, though, if I'm honest. I felt as though uh, we played with sort of a front three with Lacazette through the middle, Aubameyang mainly operating from the left and, of course, um, uh, Mesut Ozil operating from the right. It was very fluid, though, wasn't it? Um, you know, they, they did keep rotating. They did keep changing positions. And often uh, we saw Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang making the diagonal run across and he managed to get in behind a few times by doing that. So that was that was great to see, uh, you know, the fluidity in and amongst that three. Um, I, I thought we started the game brilliantly well. I thought we controlled possession very, very well. Um, we did carve out some good opportunities in that first half. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang took his goal uh, very well. He also went close shortly before when he tried to lob Matt Ryan after Guendouzi picked him out brilliantly. And then, of course, there was the other opportunity, which he took down on his chest and, and unfortunately, the keeper read what he wanted to do there and, and pulled off a really, really good save. But my sort of disappointment comes from the fact that we were so dominant. We were on top and we just seemed to be reluctant to step it up that extra gear and really take the game to Brighton and essentially put the game beyond them. I, I didn't think we did that. Um and we probably should have. And of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's easy to look back and say, oh, you know, in hindsight, we should have done this or we should have done that. But it's something that I've seen many times this season with Arsenal. There's a reluctance to um, step up a gear, particularly in the first half of games. And I don't know if it's tactical. You know, I've spoken about it before. That is the slow start part of the plan. Well, I don't think anybody intentionally wants to start games slowly, but you know, in this case, we had the good start. We had the strong start. Brighton were, were at sixes and sevens. They were all over the place. Um, and, you know, I felt that we had an easy ride of it early on. But we didn't make it count. We didn't punish them. We didn't up um, a gear and, and really take them, uh, take the game to them and put Brighton to the sword. And ultimately, towards the end of the first half, we paid the price, didn't we? Talking about Brighton's equaliser, um, it was Jurgen Lokadia that got the goal. Uh, you know, it came from an Arsenal corner, long ball over the top. Uh, Stefan Lichsteiner has probably misjudged the flight of the ball there. He's gone to head it. He's made a mistake. He's miscued it. And unfortunately, the ball's ended up in the path of the Brighton forward, who's taken one step around the onrushing Burned Leno and then slotted the ball into the back of the net. Um, looking at with whom the fault lies... You know, you could say Stefan Licksteiner for misjudging the flight of the ball, um, for heading the ball into the striker's path. A lot of people have blamed Bernd Leno for coming rushing out. Um, I think it's a bit of everything, isn't it? I think, first of all, when you're leading a game 1-0 away from home, you should never be in that situation where you get caught out as badly as we were when you're attacking from a corner. You know, we, we were in the driving seat. We were winning the game. We were by far 
the more dominant side. Brighton hadn't really had a sniff up until that point. So to get caught on the break like that was very disappointing. I felt that we probably didn't leave enough cover back as we should have in that situation. Um, and that's where Arsenal need to get a little bit smarter. That's not always just down to the manager. You know, it's down to the players themselves to look around and say, if we do lose the ball here, we're a little bit stretched and we need to make sure that we have sufficient cover in place. That didn't happen. The ball came over. Lichsteiner's header was poor. Um, of course, it was Leno coming out, sort of um, made the striker's mind up for him as to what he needed to do with the ball. He just took it around the keeper and that was it. You know, he rolled it into the back of the net. A simple 1-1 and all of a sudden all that hard work was undone. Um, for me, my issue with Lichsteiner was well, yesterday, and, and not just yesterday, actually, in, in recent games, is is not just that scenario. It's not just the mistakes at the back. It's it's more so that we're playing a system that relies heavily on the fullbacks getting forward. Sevan Licksteiner in that first half at Brighton found himself in very good positions on more than one occasion, and he just didn't make the most of it. The final ball wasn't there, the cross, the pullback the pass, the control, it just wasn't there. And for me, you know, that is a huge loss um, when you think, you know, Hector Bellerin's been out for a while now and Hector Bellerin is a player who has been criticised heavily by Arsenal fans in, in the last sort of year or so. And and I think what we've seen in the last few weeks when he's been missing, whether it be Maitland-Niles or Licksteiner playing in that position, that they're not as good as him. They just don't have that, um, A, the pace, uh, that he does the uh, composure in the final third to pull the ball back across to pick out a man. We, they just don't have that. And Licksteiner's letting us down at the moment offensively and defensively. And you, yeah, you'll probably say, you know, he's a right back. His job is to defend. However, in Unai Emery's system, the fullbacks play a huge part in, in our attacking threat. And if, if we don't have fullbacks that are fit for purpose that can do the role that Emery is asking them to do then that's not going to work is it and and we need to look to address that ASAP um, some people have leveled some criticism as well at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang for missing uh, a couple of opportunities I was disappointed he missed that chance uh, the one where he took it down on his chest and sort of I thought he made it obvious as to what he was going to do and obviously Ryan read it and got down and made a very good save um but I think when you look at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang's goal record of late, um, it is very harsh to criticise him, isn't it? It's very harsh to say this guy's not doing the business in front of goal. I mean, the record speaks for itself. So I'm not going to go into that one too much. All you need to do is look at the statistics. At half time of the game, um, I was watching it on Sky Sports, as I'm sure most of you listening in or watching in the UK would have been. Um, Alex Scott at halftime made a point of digging up Mesut Ozil for seemingly not uh, following his man all the way back for the goal. I think that's extremely harsh. Um, and, and you know what else I'll say? I bet none of you uh, would have said that if you didn't watch Alex Scott's analysis. And that that's the thing that annoys me. You know, it wasn't glaringly obvious. I don't think anyone watched that goal, watched that attack unfold and said, oh my God, Mesut Ozil, what are you doing? It's only after Alex Scott's brought it to people's attention that they've gone off about it and gone mad about it. And I just wish sometimes people would have a mind of their own and watch a game of football with their own eyes and not what they're being told, um, you know, by pundits. And I actually think Alex Scott's an, an OK pundit. I don't have any issues with her. I'm not digging her out. That's her opinion. I just don't agree with it. I think in a, in a game where you're playing with Xhaka, Guendouzi and Torreira, across your midfield. Mesa Ozil is the last one of those players that you expect to be tracking back. The last one that you expect to be defensively aware. The last one that you want to see running back uh, towards his own goal. So it, it, because of that, I just feel that the criticism was harsh. I feel that Una Emery played the midfield he did to cater for Mesa Ozil. So then to criticise Mesa Ozil for not doing what those three should have been doing is, is very... Um, is very harsh and, and it's just people's agendas coming out again, aren't they? Um, agendas are coming to the forefront of, of every conversation again at the moment. Granit Xhaka was taking the corner. I don't expect him to run back. Um, but, you know, th th there was plenty of players that could have, I'm not saying stayed back, but should have been aware and should have been ready to track back in the event that we lost the ball. Um, so to dig out Mesut Ozil on that was unfair for me. Mesut Ozil then got hooked off at half time. Um, Unai Emery, again, as he always does, said it was tactical. 
Well, what was tactical about it? What was tactical about it? It's 1-1 at Brighton um, at half time. If you've got any aspirations of making the top four, you need to be looking to win games like Brighton. And that's no disrespect to them, but we're, we're Arsenal. We are the Arsenal. Arsenal Football Club, probably the third biggest club in this country after Manchester United and Liverpool, I'd say. We should be going to places like Brighton on the front foot. We should be looking to win these games. And for me... That was such a negative move to take him off, to take off your most creative player. It made absolutely no sense. And to replace him with who? Alex Iwobi, a player who, for me, started the season fantastically well. People were talking about how he was Arsenal's most improved player. And, and for a part of the season, you, you couldn't disagree with that. You know, you, it was dead right. But now he's he's not performing at that level. He's regressed again. He's gone back to the Alex Iwobi we've seen of old. And and for me to think that he could have more impact on a game than Mesut Ozil drives me absolutely nuts. I can't, for the life of me, understand why Unai Emery made that decision. Um, you know, yes, he's he's made lots of decisions this season that have proved right and fair play to him. I'm the first one to give him praise when that's the case. But also, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with pointing out when he makes a mistake. And for me, that was a, a costly error, a costly error. I cannot think of one chance of note that Arsenal created in that second half after Mesut Ozil had left the pitch. And then, of course, he took off Alexander Lacazette. Another baffling decision. You need a goal. Why would you take off um, Alexander Lacazette? Yes, he's not our leading marksman, but he is probably the sharpest in and around the penalty area. His link-up play is brilliant. We saw it for the goal. He is so important to the way this Arsenal team play. And to take him off... When you need a goal made absolutely no sense. There's two changes that made no sense whatsoever. Um, and, you know, it, you saw his reaction when he came off the pitch. He was bitterly disappointed and not for the first time. And and, and this is becoming a thing. Mesa Ozil getting hooked, getting annoyed with the manager. Alexander Lacazette getting hooked, getting annoyed with the manager. This is, you know, this is not being done at the beginning, when, when Unai Emery was making these changes, people used to say, you know, he's doing it on merit. Unai Emery picks his side on merit. If you're playing well, you stay on. If you're playing poorly, you come off. Well, right now, it's not being done on merit because there were worse players in the Arsenal team yesterday than Mesut Ozil when he was taken off. And there were certainly worse players on the pitch in an Arsenal shirt than Alexander Lacazette when he was hooked. So it, it just makes no sense to me. He just doesn't fancy certain players. And, and for me, that's going to cost him. It's going to bite him in the arse eventually. Mesut Ozil um, can't be happy at the moment. Alexander Lacazette can't be happy at the moment. And Aaron Ramsey's already off. That's three key Arsenal players that, you know, seem to not be getting on with the manager. And I get that people are saying these are Wenger's players and he wants to build his own team and he wants to bring his own people in. And that's right. But do you trust this board to back him and back him enough to be able to bring in uh, some heavy hitters in those positions, because I don't. I don't trust the Arsenal board to get behind Unai Emery in the transfer market. You're going to see it in January. Hardly anything will be done in January. I'm pretty sure of that. And I don't think, you know, you know, when the summer comes, that we'll back him enough. Arsenal need heavy investment. This is a team that needs hundreds of millions of pounds to get back to where it belongs. And, and that's not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, when you do have talented players... Um, like Ozil, like Lacazette, like Ramsey, you need to find a way of getting the best out of them. And right now, we're not doing that. We're just not doing it. Am I saying that I want Unai Emery out? Absolutely not. And I've tweeted a few things after the game yesterday and I've had people come at me, you know, how can you criticise him so early in his tenure? Well, I'm allowed to criticise Unai Emery. Just like everybody else was allowed to criticise Arsene Wenger, a club legend, we can criticise Unai Emery. For me, Unai Emery uh, has earned less respect from the Arsenal fans than Arsene Wenger did during his period. So why was it OK to do it to him, but it's not OK to do it to Unai Emery? I'm not saying I want him sacked. I'm not saying I want him out. But there are some fundamental errors uh, that are coming to the forefront now, more often than they were uh, probably earlier on in the season. He, I, I felt there were a lot of games where he got away with making poor decisions. And, and as a result, we don't talk about them, do we? We don't talk about managerial decisions when we win the game. We only talk about them when we don't. And and so for me, there's nothing wrong with criticising him. There's nothing wrong with picking out things that probably could have been done in a better way. And I just think that's that's one of them. 
I also think that the tactics are getting a little bit one-dimensional. I think that uh, we've been sussed out by a few of our opponents of late. Um, I think that Brighton probably played us as well as anybody else has in, in recent months. I think they they worked us out to a T, and I'll explain what I mean. So for those of you watching um, via YouTube, I'm going to use my little tactics board to describe what I'm trying to say. For those of you on the audio, I will do my best uh, to describe it, of course. So those of you who have watched the recent um, video podcasts or been listening uh, via the audio, you would have heard me talking about um, our insistence on playing out from the back and the fact that our centre-backs are being asked to split wide open in order to create angles um, and try and invite uh, the opponents onto us. Well, at Brighton, we saw a classic example of what happens when your opponents don't fall for it. They don't get sucked into that trap. You know, you end up having lots of the ball in these areas. The centre-backs had lots of the ball at Brighton, but the channels to the midfield were being cut out at every opportunity. And then as a result, you end up with the likes of Xhaka or Guendouzi having to drop back into the defence to collect the ball. And and you just end up back at square one. It feels like we have so much possession um, in and amongst the, the central defensive areas but we don't have a way out of it. We we just don't. It, it's, you know, Brighton were very clever in the way that they sat off us yesterday um, and only worried about closing off the channels to the midfield as opposed to pressing us really high up. You know, they're happy for Socrates and Koscielny to have the ball all day long because they're not going to pick a, out a killer pass from there, are they? Um, and, and that's the thing. We saw a classic example of what happens when you try and play that way and your opponent says, you know what? I won't press you. I won't push to the edge of your penalty area. We're going to stay in our shape. We're going to stay compact. And all we're going to do is cut out those channels between your defence and your midfield. The ball goes back to the other centre-half, back to him again, back to the goalkeeper, um, back to one of the defensive midfielders who drops in the hole um, and looks to try and get things going. But it just doesn't seem to be working. There's no other option. In the case where your opponent does that, like Brighton did, we need to find another way of playing. We need to find another way of getting the ball um, into our forward players, whether that's by bypassing the midfield and going direct. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. That's something that needs to be worked on, though, because, as I said, Brighton sat off us. They uh, allowed our players to have possession of the ball along the back line. We spread out. Uh, we tried to make the angles. Our fullbacks pushed further up the pitch. But Brighton, all they did was stepped into the midfield, cut out those those channels and cut out the channels to the fullbacks. Now, the issue is when, when your centre-backs do pull as wide as ours do, the angle to the fullback then becomes smaller, doesn't it? Because you can literally play the ball down the line. You don't have as much room um, in these channels here to play the ball down the line, you know, and it's easily cut out. So for me, th that was a big concern yesterday and that had a lot to do with why we couldn't create anything in the second half, why we couldn't get going, because Brighton decided to sit off us, cut out the channels into our midfield, uh, cut out the channels to our fullbacks. And, and you know, we don't have any cre creativity, sorry, in the central defensive area. Most teams don't. Um, so the chances are they're going to nullify you if, if they do that. And that was some great tactics uh, from Chris Hewton. And, and I think he hit the nail on the head and he, he sussed uh, Unai Emery's side out yesterday. Am I overreacting to the Boxing Day draw? I don't think so. Um, I think that was as poorly as I've seen Arsenal play this season. Um, I think there were some fundamental errors on the manager's part in terms of uh, his tactics and his substitutions. Um, I thought we were negative uh, having taken the lead and we probably should have gone on and really put right into the sword. Um, but does that mean I want Unai Emery sacked? No. Does that mean that I don't think he needs another few transfer windows to sort this team out? No, of course it doesn't. This is a work in progress, Arsenal Football Club. Um, I'm not jumping to any conclusions. I'm not saying that I want him gone. I'm just telling you what I see. Uh, these are my observations following the Arsenal. And, and, you know, there will be people out there that disagree with me. Of course there will. There will be equally, there'll be people that do agree with me. Um, and that's absolutely fine. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear your opinions. That's what it's all about. So do please tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Um, do subscribe to this channel. Do hit the like button on the video. That's ever so important in us climbing up the recommended videos list. Uh, so please do all of those things. Keep supporting the podcast. Um, 
I'm so proud that, you know, we've built the audience that we have of late. Um, so thank you all very much for your support. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful uh, new year. Um, I should be putting out a pod after the Liverpool game. But just in case I get a little bit too busy and I don't get the chance, um, then I hope you all have a wonderful time. And hopefully 2019 brings uh, many successes for Arsenal Football Club and, of course, Unai Emery. So I'll be back in a few days' time. Until then, uh, keep eating, keep drinking, keep enjoying the holiday season. And uh, ciao.